praying for health issues, keep praying for financial issues, keep Turn and slay the priests of the Lord. 
what a scary statement to me that somewhere in the process of time, now you begin to add, attack the ministry. Because their hand also is with David. And because they knew when he fled and did not show it to him. Saul basically, if you read the content of the verse, Saul was upset because David had met with one of the priests. And there was another individual that I'll talk a little bit about tonight. And he, Doeg, he, he seen David and one of the priests speaking. He went back to Saul and he told them what oh, David and the priest was had gotten together and they were communicating. And Saul was mad because that was hell from Saul's knowledge. And because of that, Saul said, kill all the priests. Pretty extreme, huh? Amen. Well, there's a reason why it was extreme. Because they knew when he fled and did not show it to me. Now notice this when Saul told the servant to the footman to kill the priest. But the servants of the king would not put forth their hand to fall upon the priest of the Lord. But the servant of the God knew better than to kill the priest. Amen. Next verse. And the king said to Doeg, Turn thou and fall upon the priest, so the servants won't kill him. So he turns to Doeg. And Doeg the Edomite, everybody say the Edomite. Edomite. Very interesting that this is inserted here, because that's very significant too. And Doeg the Edomite turned, and he fell upon the priest, and slew on that day four score and five persons that did wear a linen ephod. Doeg had no hesitation. But what's interesting to me is it's very, it's very clear, Sister Brenna, that Doeg didn't just kill anybody. He wore the priest who wore the one. And didn't be fought. Everybody say that he didn't be fought. And now the city of the priests smote he with the edge of the sword, both men and women, children and sucklings, and oxen and asses and sheep with the edge of the sword. Oh boy, that crazy. He got the license he killed and he just, it, like, he was waiting for the opportunity. Everyone's waiting for the opportunity. Because inside of Doeg was a lot of bitterness. Inside of Doeg was a lot of hatred that had been passed down to him generations. Because he was an Edomite, and the Edomites, the Bible says, actually comes from Esau. And Esau's hatred towards Jacob and Israel. Look at that. Next. And one of the sons of Ahimelech, the son of Ahitab, named Abiathar, escaped and fled after David. And Abiathar showed David that Saul had slain the Lord's priest. Next verse. And David said unto Abiathar, I knew it that day when Doeg the Edomite was here, and he would surely tell Saul, I have occasioned the death of all the persons of my father's house. Because um, those are the two that got together, but they knew Doeg who heard the conversation. And, and abide thou with me, fear not. For he that seeketh my life, seeketh thy life. But with me, Thou shalt be in safeguard. Next verse. No, I'm going to stop there. Abide thou with me, fear not, for he that seeketh my life, seeketh thy life. With me thou shalt be in safeguard. I want to simply title this message. I got a million titles to title it, but. I want to title it, The Linen Ephah. Look at your neighbor and say, The Linen Ephah. Look at your other neighbor and say, The Linen Ephah. 
Thank you, Lord, for your word. Hallelujah. Bless the ministry of your word. Lord. And everybody say, in Jesus' name. Jesus. You may be seated tonight. I, um, I got all kinds of thoughts, but the main thought is, I want you to know that the adversary will attack those who were the ephod. The linen ephod is symbolic of praise. It's the garment that the priest had to put on to go into the holy place to conduct the services of the temple. And it's symbolic. You know, we've seen that we let the scriptures have put on the garment of praise. praise. This is the garment of praise with the linen ephod. When they would put on the linen ephod and walk into the holy place to, uh, to make the sacrament um, to offer the praise unto God before they come before the holiest of holies. But I want to tell you tonight that the adversary will attack those who wear the ephod. But significant tonight, Brother Jarvis, is he attacked and he killed the priests who wore the linen ephod, except one. There's one he didn't kill. And there always, he will never be able to kill them all. We sang about praise tonight. I want to talk a little bit about praise tonight. The devil will attack your praise. The devil will want you to magnify the negative things and not the positive things. The devil will make an attempt to shut your mouth. You don't care if you come here. You don't care if you come to church. You don't care if you pay your tithes. But he knows that once you start praising, if he can steal your song, if he can rob your praise, he can get you. It's Noah who was an Edomite. He was probably the most ruthless and cruel of the servants of King Saul. And Doeg hated worship with a passion. Doeg hated worship with such intensity that it was beyond our wildest imagination. When we look in a heartbeat, he didn't think twice of killing all the priests. He didn't think twice, Sister Buena, of executing the integral part of worship for the community, for the people of God. He hated it so bad right. that once he was given the proverbial license to kill, he took advantage of it and he killed those with the little ephod. He killed the women, he killed the children. He just massacred everything. When we look at Doak, who was an Edomite, I want to give you a little back history of the Edomites. The Edomites were descendants of Esau. The Bible tells us in Genesis that Esau moved to Mount Seir. He married and he became Edom. And the Edomites, because they were descendants of Esau, Esau was the one who sealed his own fate. And he sealed the fate of his generation to follow when he traded his birthright for a pot of leather or a pot of stew. When he traded that birthright with Jacob, because he was hungry for the story, he not only sealed his faith, but it's evident that he sealed the faith of um, his descendants. Because generations later, when we come to Doeg, Doeg is still holding a grudge. There's something that was passed down. We know it's interesting because they say that Esau is the father of the Edomites. And they also say Esau is possibly also the father of the Kenizzites and the Amalekites. Which don't sound, would sound familiar, right? The, the, some of the people that come against the people of God. And when you look at Esau, Brother Jarvis, although Esau pros prospered in the world, es Esau produced a lineage of kings over Israel. Esau did some great things, but Esau never, ever regained that spiritual preeminence that he could have had. Esau was never able to regain that birthright and that place that he should have been, could have been, would have been. 
He was not able to regain that place, that spiritual place. But he was also not able to regain that place in his family either. By his birthright, he was afforded by his birthright to have the spiritual preeminence with Israel or with the Hebrews. But the Bible says the blessing went to Jacob to whom Esau sold his birthright. I tried to picture Jacob and Esau growing up. I tried to picture these two boys in their lives. I tried to picture that Jacob, and as long as he was alive, was a, was a, was a thorn in his flesh. Jacob was a painful reminder, Sister Kathy, of what Esau might have been and what Esau could have been. And in the process of time, that reminder created in Esau a bitterness. Literally consumed Esau in the process of time. Eventually Esau didn't want nothing to do with Jacob. Eventually Esau didn't want nothing to do with Israel. But as time went on, his feelings began to pass down to the next generation and the next generation. And some houses went on when they got to Doeg's generation. It wasn't just feeling the bitterness of Doeg. It was an intense, festering hatred in Doeg. So the scripture that I read to you tonight, we see the conflict between King Saul and David. And we see by this time, David had already been anointed. By this time, Sister Puebla, David had already slain Goliath. By this time, David had already gained a measure of popularity amongst the people. What I read to you tonight was not when David was a shepherd boy sitting on the side of the shepherd that nobody knew about. No, no, no. By this time, he had already been anointed and he was going to be the king. By this time, he had already slain Goliath. By this time, at the top, yeah. the people already was giving him praises and accolades. And, right. and he, was, he was establishing this um, relationship and popularity with the people at this point in time. And interestingly enough, instead of King Saul rewarding him for slaying Goliath, rewarding him for being popular with the people, rewarding him for being anointed king, King Saul becomes increasingly jealous of him. Be careful for jealousy. I said be careful for jealousy. You're not going to always be the top dog on, on, on the hill for, the, for your whole life. You're going to have to pass it on to somebody someday. And the interesting thing is, as often is the case, when people clash, when King Saul and David, and when there is a clash of friction between them, you know who gets caught in the middle? But according to that story, King Saul didn't lie. David didn't lie. He was a priest of God. And sometimes, as often as it is, when, when people clash, yep, the ministry gets caught right smack in the middle. King Saul accuses the priest, Ahimelech. And King Saul accuses him, and what we read today, he said, you are, you are conspiring with David. You, you, you are conspiring against my throne with David. And Ahimelech tries to reassure King Saul, no, no, no king. David is loyal to you. No king. If you read it verses before, he says, no king. David is loyal to you. He wasn't conspiring to do anything against you. That's not why we met king. He says, well, I heard you met and I had an issue with that because you didn't tell me about it. He goes, oh no, I'm, David is loyal. David is devoted to you, King Saul. Read it, and it says that we, 1 Samuel 20, 21, and 22. 
He's loyal to you. He's devoted to you. And the priest also says, Saul, this isn't even your son-in-law. He's not coming against you. For some reason, King Saul was so furious that none of that appeased the king. And, and, and we're not surprised that Doeg was the instigator of all of this because he hated him. Doeg was that, that one person who just likes to always stir the pot. Oh, uh, you know what I heard? But, but, but I'm listening up. No, 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 I don't want to get anybody in trouble. You, you know what King saw? I see him just go over there and I know Gary Tito's. He was figuring out how to boot you. I know already he's got a plan to go. And you never hear from him. And, and yeah, but I just like you know him. I don't like that stuff. I just like you know him. Just keep your heads up. It wasn't surprising that Joy went to this theater and he stirred himself anger. When you look at the scripture, he heard the conversation. He witnessed the meeting between David and Ahimelech. But when we when we look at the scripture of why David went to Ahimelech, the Bible teaches us that David was turning to the ministry. He was turning to the priests of the he, he went there and Ahimelech did three things for David. One, he inquired of the Lord for David. Yes. Two, the Bible says he fed him hallow and bread. And three, he gave him the lion's sword. You know what the Himalayan did? A Himalayan did what the priest was supposed to do. Minister to the needs. That was his responsibility. Go ahead. Was angry. And he immediately accused the Himalayan. Where am I going with this? King Saul calls all of the priests to gather in law. He tells them, okay, appear before me, all of you, and now come, 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 come. And Ahimelech tries to explain that's not what happened, King Saul. But King Saul was so frustrated and mad, he was beyond reason. He found them all guilty for the Tom, and he said, kill them all. He called the servants, kill them all. But the servants would not kill the priests of the Lord. The Bible says they would not put their hand to fall upon the priests of the Lord. And Saul wasn't going to kill him himself, so he turned to Doeg. And here Doeg, at Saul's word, obeys him and kills them. Four score and five persons. He killed and wore the linen Esau. You see, Doeg's job was simple for the Carl. Joe Doeg's job was destroy all of Israel's priests of praise. Destroy all of them who wore the linen ephah. The linen ephah was the garment, Sister Angel, that was worn by the priests when they went to worship the Lord. And on that day and now, Doeg succeeded in slaughtering Israel's priests with much ease. I, don't, I cannot comprehend Brother Jarvis what kind of hatred he must have had to kill and to slaughter God's priests of praise. What kind of hatred that he must have had to kill all the priests that were responsible for praising. Satan hates praise. He hates, he hates, he hates praise. You ever notice? No matter how bad it's going or how depressed you get or how down you get, sometimes it's difficult to sing a song. Because the devil don't want you to sing. But when you start praising, when it's not going good, but somehow you got in your, your mind and your spirit, I will bless the Lord, oh my soul. Oh, when we pray. 
can shut your mouth because praise does something with inviting yes, the presence yes. of God. I, I cannot fully explain it to you, but I know it works. I will enter his gates with thanksgiving and into his courts with praise. It doesn't matter what went on last week or today or this morning. If I can just get my hands up and open my mouth and bless the Lord, if I can get my eyes on this Lord and on, if I can see ye first the kingdom, if I can let, let I will bless the Lord at all times be my mantra. If I can, I told the Lord one time, I said, you know God, no matter how bad it gets, I got to praise you. Because your word said um, that everything that has breath Praise the Lord. Sometimes I gotta check my pulse and I go. After I brush my teeth, of course. I still got breath, no matter how bad it seems. I still got a, a responsibility to praise ye the Lord. Good had an easy shot at those who wore the linen ephod. If he could take them out of the town, he would have been successful. Satan hates praise. That's right. I said he hates praise. Amen. Because the priests of praise have always played a significant spiritual role in the things of God. That's right. They are significant. I read in my scripture, we are a royal what? Priesthood. The Bible says when the priests would enter into the outer court, of the tabernacle. Yes. The first piece of furniture that he would encounter was what? Who knows? The brazen altar. And the priest, maybe you don't know this, I don't know, did not wear the linen ephod at the brazen altar. The priest would come to the brazen altar and it was there that the sacrifice would be made and the blood sacrifice of a lamb or a bullock was made to the Lord and it was there at the brazen altar that the blood was taken from the sacrificial animal. The lamb was burned at that altar but the blood, the blood, the blood, the blood, because he needed the blood. The blood was preserved for the coral. The priest would put the blood in a vial because he was going to use the blood later as they would eventually sprinkle the blood on the mercy seat. Yes. You don't think you had a big cup of blood, do you? But he, the blood would be put in a vial. And then next, the high priest would walk to the neighbor of water. The Bible said he had to wash that he dieth not. And he would cleanse himself at the labor of water. You know where he cleansed himself from? All the blood that splashed on him. I don't know if any of you killed people when you were growing up. Or try to kill a mouse in a mouse trap. That blood is all over the place. He would wash himself. And his garments got stained with the blood. And after he would cleanse himself, Sister Puerto, and he would cleanse all traces of the sacrifice upon him, then he would put on the worship of Hyrule. And then he would enter into the holy place. Then he would put on the linen ephah. And then he would enter into the holy place. And it was here that the priests would put on the linen ephod. And when they put on the linen, linen ephod, Brother Carl, it made a declaration that it was their intention now to come before the presence yeah. of God, to come before Hallelujah. the presence of the King of Kings, and to make an offering of adoration to He who was and is and yeah. is to come. It was by putting on the linen ephod, yeah. it was making a bold declaration that I am coming into His presence yeah. and I am going to give adoration to Him. That's what happens when you walk into this place and you're ready to give a prayer. Yeah. You're making a declaration to yeah. yourself, everybody else, to the devil, to God, that I'm here. Let's get this thing rolling because I'm ready and I am going to magnify the King of Kings, Hallelujah. magnify the Lord of Lord. This is this is not my time to repent of my sins. I'm I'm coming in to worship Him, yeah. to praise Him, Great. to adore Him, yeah. to come into His presence. Yes. Yeah. Scripture says, "Put on the garment of praise for the Spirit." of heaviness. 
would have the vial of the lamb's blood in one hand, and he would have the censer or the, the coals mixed with the holy anointing oil in the other hand, and the priest would walk into the holy place, and it is there that he would minister and praise and praise and minister. I, I, I cannot stress enough to you tonight about this significant point about Doeg. Doeg did not come, Sister Puella, to kill or to destroy the lamb and the bullock slayers. He didn't come to kill the priests who were sacrificing. Uh -uh. He didn't come to kill the priests who held the knife. Interesting enough, slaying and killing seems to never bother the satanic kingdom. But that we don't care for killing the people who are to kill. He don't kill who he don't care who's slain, he don't care. As a matter of fact, he himself comes to what? To steal, to kill, and to destroy. He's a killer himself. But you know what the devil don't like, right? He don't like the next piece. He don't like those who put them in the ephod and offer praise to God. Yes. He could care less what sacrifice you kill. He could care less what commitment you made. He could care less what you put on the altar because he can do all that kind of stuff. But it's yes. the next one when you put on the when you put, when you, when you put on your the ephod sheet, whatever when you put on when you get your business together and say, you know what? I, I, I'm here and, and, and I'm giving all I can. You ever know that doing worship is when you think about what bills you pay and what happened here and well, how can we raise this and we just had a fight before we left off. I, mean, I can't believe my kid that like nothing has you know that really got on my nerves and get on and out of He was after those who wore the default. But did not come after the ones who spilled the blood of the car. But he wanted the ephod bearers. He wanted the priest of praise and the priest of worship. I tell you what, now and then, Brother Jarvis, Doe, now and then the enemy, he comes to destroy those who praise. The devil knows the power of your worship and will continue to seek to destroy it. It's easier, it's easier to praise here on Sunday at 3 o'clock. This is the easiest time. I mean, if you're not crazy to hear it, you're about, I don't know. You're like, you're like those, uh, those lepers at the gate, why sit here, why sit here until you die? You would die anyway. But, I mean, if you get a praise here, you're not, I don't know. Amen. But, but it's when you go home on Monday. Right? And when you go to work on Tuesday. And Wednesday. Thursday. Come on. It's when your flesh starts rising up and the devil wants to steal your praise. I tell you tonight, there is power in praise. Yes. There is power in praise. There is power. Yes. You, you ought to make it happen. You get into your car and um, turn off 98.5 and turn off all the rock music and put on some great stuff. That might help you along. The devil is after the ephod rivers. And the enemy hates praise. It makes sense to me why King Herod tried to kill baby Jesus in the New Testament. Remember he said, everybody that's born, we're going to kill them all, right? But did you know King Herod was an Edomite? Did you know he was half Edomite to Sequoia? He was an See, the devil doesn't only want to kill our praise. The devil wants to kill our, <laughs> our uh, what do you call it? He wasn't only after their praise, but he wants to destroy the reason why they praise. He was after Jesus himself. This is what I've come to tell you tonight. At law, 85 of the 86 Jews that were gathered there died. One. I said all this to say this. Even though 99% of the time we're in the one of them. One of them. One of them. No matter what you do, you're not 
Don't let the devil tell you you're a hypocrite. Right. Only time you come to me is when you get problems. So what? At least I know where to come when I got problems. Right. Amen. Who cares? At least I know where to come. Okay. I have news for you. Every time I have problems, I go to him. And I don't feel one bit bad about it. Because I go to him because I know he is the answer. Right. He is the answer. And I was a hypocrite before I had the problem anyway. I, my statue has never been elevated enough to be part of the enemy. Here I am. Here I am. So tonight, as I close tonight, it was only that line that I highlighted in my notes. Those that were the leading ephod. It's kind of like going to the candy store and finding the candy that they never sell for so many years that he finally found the violence. What a powerful lesson. He don't want you to praise. He don't want you to put in the bar of praise. He don't, he don't want you to give your service to the King of Kings. He don't want you to adore him. Make so much sense. I invite you tonight to stand. Put on your little ephah tonight. Put on your little ephah. I'm going to praise you. I'm going to praise you. If everything is not happening how you want it to happen in your life, I'm going to praise you anyway. Surely there's something you can praise him about. that I am truly thankful and grateful. As a matter of fact, praise is actually recognizing Him anyway. Not to do with you. It's blessing Him for who He is. Magnifying Him for who He is. Lifting Him up because He is high and lifted up. I want to invite you to lift your hands tonight and let's give Him praise tonight. Let's give Him praise tonight and praise
Jesus. You'd be surprised how many people don't do that every single day. Every day. I'm taking it into the shower, whatever it is. I praise you, Jesus. I worship you, Jesus. Thank you. 